stuff necessary to reduce carbon dioxide into sugar. Okay. So we've talked a little bit about this too, I know. But there are peripheral chlorophylls in the photosystems, right? So please remember, a photosystem ought to be thought of as a canister with really thick walls. And that canister, it's uh, cylindrical, right? And so all throughout that, the wall of that cylinder, there are incorporated chlorophyll molecules. And then at the center of it, there is a reaction center core. And that's where P680, P700, and primary electron acceptors exist. At photosystem 2, that receptor molecule at the bottom, that is the molecule that's receiving energy, is P680. And in photosystem 1, it's P700. <coughs> now, I explained to you last time, I think, about how it is P680 and P700 got those numbers, right? And that, that's a correlate of the wavelength or the energy that they're most receptive to. Now, 680 nanometers, or micrometers, I forget which it is. I think it's nanometers. 680 nanometers, or 780, or 700 nanometers, is a very long wavelength relative to the other available wavelengths. So it's a fairly low energy wavelength. But that's because when we convert energy from a photon source into something else that's passed between adjacent chlorophyll molecules, some energy is lost. So by the time it gets over to P680, much of the energy originally associated with that photon has been lost. I also need you guys to understand that the process of photosynthesis is incredibly inefficient. It's estimated that like two-tenths of all the available light, of all the photons that are striking a chlorophyll molecule are actually converted into sugar. That's two-tenths of a percent. But it doesn't matter, right? Because light is free. Plants can be as inefficient as they want because they're not expending any energy collecting those photons. For us, if we were taking in sugars and only converting two-tenths of each sugar into body mass, we would have to eat a lot of food. It would be metabolically incredibly expensive. But that's because it costs us something to acquire those sugars, to acquire the nutrients. I should also mention, however, that our own efficiency of uh, converting food into body mass or into energy is relatively inefficient. It's estimated that somewhere between like 10 and 20 percent of the food that we actually consume is converted either into energy or into body mass, which isn't very good. But it's certainly better than two tenths of a percent. Okay, now. I need to introduce this term just really briefly, and that is non-cyclic phosphorylation. Phosphorylation occurs when you attach a phosphate to an ATP molecule. And this is linear. It's non-cyclic. That is, phosphates that are ultimately used don't cycle back to become more ATPs. It's a linear movement of phosphates. Or to think about it a little bit differently, and I'm going to blank this out really quickly. I'll turn it back on, I promise. But I want to show our diagram again. When ATP is created, it's not cycled back through this system. It's going to be moved to a completely different system of reactions, called the dark reactions over here. It's not cyclic. It's moving linearly from this process to the next. Okay, so that's non-cyclic phosphorylation. All right. Yep. And just to um, be clear, a cyclic would be like moving the photonic, the yeah. Phosphate. Yes. Moving the the, the hydrogen ions back to the ATP. So uh, it would be like using the ATP in here in the light reactions, and then just recycling those phosphates within the light reactions. But here we're not recycling phosphates, we're moving phosphates to 
a different series of reactions. So the phosphate has been used, it's never used in light reactions? Not immediately, no. Yeah. Okay, so products of light reactions. Importantly, ATP. And ATP is important because that's the energy that's going to be used to drive the reduction reaction of <coughs> carbon dioxide into sugar. We're also making NADPH, and NADPH is the source of those electrons, right, that's uh, facilitating this reduction reaction. And then, Im importantly, we have this metabolic waste that's produced specifically during the light reactions. When we get to the dark reactions, we're not going to be producing really much more oxygen gas. This is strictly produced within the light reaction. I hope I said that correctly. When we get to the dark reactions, no oxygen gas really is being produced. That's strictly produced within the light reactions. Okay, so now what we need to do is shift our attention to the actual manufacture of sugar. And the dark reactions, I actually want to blank this out and diagram the dark reactions on the board. Instead of structures that are facilitating the enzymatic conversion of carbon dioxide, I want to just kind of ambiguously show you the conversion of molecules. So give me a minute while I erase this. Is it okay that I erase this? Anybody else want to make a picture of it? Okay, so when plants inhale, what exactly are they inhaling? Carbon dioxide is what they're using, right? So they need to get a bunch of this stuff. And what's going to happen is we're going to take some of that stuff to make some of this stuff, right? Now, there is an enzyme called RUBP or Rubisco that is sensitive to carbon dioxide and it picks it up. And Rubisco <coughs> is a five carbon molecule. Okay? So this is R-U-B-P. Really you need to think about it as like an enzyme. And this enzyme has one job and its job is to take carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and attach it to itself. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take three rubiscos or three RUBPs. And what we're going to do with that is we're going to pick up three carbon dioxides. Now carbon dioxides consist of carbon and oxygen, but I'm just going to draw the carbon molecule or excuse me, the carbon atom. And we're going to take three of these. Now, the important and the confusing part of the dark reactions is our carbon accounting. We need to keep track of how many carbons we have at each stage. Because ultimately, at the end of the dark reactions, we have to get three rubiscos back. Adam, what was your question? So a rubisco is a what again? It's, it's a protein <clears throat> or an enzyme that picks up carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is inhaled by the plant, right, with oxygen and nitrogen and other things. And that carbon dioxide is picked up by Rubisco. So that when you take these three carbon dioxides and stick them to the three Rubiscos, what you get is three
six carbon molecules. <coughs> This stage right here is called fixation. In fixation, what happens is we take a carbon dioxide molecule and we stick it under Rubisco. That's it. OK. So this is the dark reactions? These are the dark reactions, yep. Okay. So far, we haven't used any energy, and we haven't used any of our NADPH. Okay. Yep. So is, I'm kind of jumping farther, but is the Calvin cycle cycle a dark reaction? Yep. That's a synonym for the dark reactions, the Calvin cycle. Okay, so how many carbons do we have right here? If we have three rubiscos, how many carbons does that represent? Five. And if we have three of them? Three rubiscos, and each has five carbons on them. Fifteen. So we have fifteen carbons right here. And how many carbons are there across three carbon dioxides? Three. Exactly right. So we have three carbons right here. Two. Right? So if we have three of this intermediate molecule, Total, how many carbons do we have? How many carbons are on this one? One, two, three, four, five, six, eight, 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 18 carbons total, right? Three six carbon molecules. That's the fixation process. We okay with that? Now, ultimately, what we want to do is we want to take those three six carbon molecules and we're going to reduce them into six three carbon molecules. And I'm actually going to draw these out. Now, in order to do that, this is a metabolic activity that requires some energy. So what we're going to do is we're going to take six ATPs, and we're going to use the phosphates for the energy from them. And we're going to get back six ADPs. So we've expended some energy. That's all we're saying here. We've used six ATPs. Okay. Also, because it's a reduction reaction, or we're dropping electrons off, we're going to have to use some of our NADPH. So we use six NADPHs, and we get back six NADP pluses. This phase right here is called the reduction phase. Okay? Now, these uh, six three carbon molecules are also are all called G3P or glycerol 3 phosphate. Since there is a phosphate on it, we know where the phosphates from our ATPs went. They got stuck onto these molecules. There are six of them. Each of them has one phosphate. So we had to use six ATPs to make our six G3Ps. Okay, now what ultimately we have to do is get our rubiscos back. And how many carbons were there across our three rubiscos? Fifteen. So how many G3Ps are we going to have to use to get back our rubiscos? We're going to have to have 15 carbons, and how many G3Ps is that? It's 
close to four. Five, yeah, exactly, it's five. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to take five of these and convert them back into rubiscos. And to do that, we're going to have to expend a little bit more energy. I think we use three ATPs. to get them back. So we're going to use these five to make our Rubisco back, which means that we're left over with one G3P. And ultimately, that glycerol 3-phosphate, that G3P, can become part of our sugar molecule. Okay. So this phase right here is called reclamation. We're reclaiming our rubiscos. And that's the dark reaction in a nutshell. This one right here is going to go to sugar. So the lie that we've told you from the outset that both I and your high school biology teachers told you was that the product of the dark reactions is glucose, and it's not. We're not making any glucose at this point. What we're making is G3Ps. How many G3Ps would you need to make a full glucose molecule? Looking at that, could you figure it out? Two. You need two G3Ps. Why is it two G3Ps? So we have one, two, three carbons, and into a glucose molecule there are six. So how many turns of the Calvin cycle, or the dark reactions, do we need to make one glucose molecule? Two. If we say that each Calvin turn of the Calvin cycle uses three carbon dioxide. Okay, so total, how many ATPs have we used? It's close to six. Nine. Nine, right? We had used six at reduction, three more at reclamation. And how many electrons?